Welcome to our COVID-19 Global Conversation Series hosted by the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nico Svitek. I'm a DAD Visiting Assistant Professor, uh, DAD is short for German Academic Exchange Service, and today I'm having a conversation with uh, Christoph Strunk, Professor for Social Policy at the University of Siegen, and he is also director of the Institute for Gerontology in Dortmund, and I'm reaching him in Düsseldorf right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Christoph. Good evening. Uh, you can find a link to both our full bios on the webpage hosting this series. Um, every country in the world is affected by the novel coronavirus, and Germany is no exception. Um, just to give you some context, we saw the first official cases end of January in Munich, connected to a Chinese national traveling there from Shanghai. Um, but it seems that this cluster was rather successfully contained. And then at the end of February, cases started rising in different regions in Germany. And we had the first two deaths associated with COVID-19 on March 9. Um, but compared to other European countries, uh, or in international comparison, uh, fatalities in Germany stayed rather low, and Germany is already starting to ease some of the restrictions. So, Christoph, would you say that Germany uh, seemed to have dealt rather well with the crisis, and if so, why? Yeah, I think by and large it went pretty well, and flattening the curve has been pretty successful up until now. And I think there's two or maybe three reasons for this. The first reason is uh, crisis management has gone pretty well. I mean, crisis management uh, by the federal government, but also by state governments, and they work together pretty uh, pretty well, which is not the usual case, uh, not necessarily. Uh, secondly, um, we've seen heavy testing in Germany. So testing is one of the ingredients that uh, has made sure that fatality uh, rates are relatively low. And the third factor is that Germany has always had a very high share of intensive care units in hospitals. And the government uh, even uh, boosted those intensive care units. So we have not seen any um, real burden on hospitals until now, which is also a very, very reliable indicator for uh, dealing with this crisis. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's quite some experts who say that testing is kind of the key to success because then you can, you really know where the uh, infection is spreading. But why was Germany able to have that many tests? I mean, it's a new virus. Um, why was Germany able to, to produce all these tests necessary to ramp up testing that quick? I think that was a very strong effort of coordinating research and the and, and uh, companies that work and, and in this respect. And of course, several tests are now uh, are used for this. And uh, but honestly, there are still some loopholes. Just to give you one example, uh, nursery homes, for instance, which are very crucial in this crisis, not only in Germany. There are not that many tests in nursery homes or homes for the elderly, which is a problem or might be even a bigger problem in the foreseeable future. So this is a, a spot where testing should be better or should be uh, should be uh, have a larger share. But by and large, I think the, uh, the healthcare system in this respect was worked very well usually you have more fragmentation in german uh, germany's healthcare system but in this case coordination went pretty well mm -hmm. and can i ask how how is your personal situation right now i, I know that the semester uh, in germany started end of april so you're teaching at the university again now how are you, you in your daily life dealing with this new situation oh. Well, my, my and our daily lives is more or less completely digital, of course. We, so teaching is 100% is digital right now, and we are scaling up resources and stuff. So this is, I think, this is a very a good experience for all of us. Um, we, personally and privately, I think I'm, uh, I cannot complain. I mean, my wife and I, we are in civil, we are civil servants, so salary is stable. We can uh, work at home, uh, take care of our kids. So I think wait, compared to, for instance, single parents or people that usually work in restaurants, which are now in big trouble, of course, uh, we, are, we, we cannot complain. We are, have a very relatively convenient situation. Mm -hmm. And, and already in your first answer, you said that federalism played a role in why Germany was successful. 
Um, and I mean, that's kind of similar to the US where you have a strong federal state and a lot of health issues and lockdown restrictions are decided on, on state level. Um, and you said, I mean, often there's tension or, or conflict. Uh, wh why did it work so well uh, that the different state governments and the national government coordinated so well in this crisis? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, uh, there's a, a, a big, I mean, of course, the Chancellor, Angela Merkel, played a big role. She, she, managed, um, she managed to bring the states together and to, and to, to tell them and to, to convince them that we now need coordinated efforts, that were, which doesn't necessarily mean that all the states uh, pick the same policy. But in terms of the, the, the crucial, crucial approaches, they, uh, they just went along the same path. So Merkel and Chancellor, was, she was, and she still is, an important factor in this. Uh, another aspect is the, I mean, in Germany, the states are in charge of um, governing or governing and funding hospitals, at least partly. So you need the states to have a, a decentralized effort to make sure that the hospitals um, can definitely um, deal with this with this crisis, and well, along with coordinating the states in the in, in the transfer league, I think this has gone pretty well. Although we are now in a new stage, of course, in Germany, we now have a more decentralized approach. It's more now about local efforts to tame the disease and to prevent uh, outbreaks at at local or regional level. Mm -hmm. That's a good point because um, one specific factor in Germany is that you have uh, local municipal institutions, the Gesundheitsämter, health agencies on, on local level, was that played that a role um, in, in helping to combat this pandemic because they have a lot of local no knowledge and, and are in the regions where things are difficult and can act right away. Did that help? Hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion about local public authorities in Germany because usually about up until the COVID crisis, uh, most of them were, were understaffed. They had just uh, a couple of people that could take care of certain issues. And now, uh, now the healthcare system uh, it clearly sees that local public authorities play a major role. Um, one issue is then now that a lot of people, a lot of volunteers are hired uh, hired by local public authorities to trace infections. So they, they have managed to, well, to forge networks that help to trace all those uh, infections. Of course, they still um, are lagging behind in terms of digital technology and equipment. So to equip local public authorities also with digital tools will be another challenge in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So, as in other states, uh, Germans saw heavy infringements on their daily lives to, to combat this, uh, the spread of the pandemic. Um, how would you say did Germans accept these measures and how was the balance of voluntary and, and mandatory measures? Hmm. Well, I think most Germans are aware that uh, all the measures were, have not been as strict as measures in Spain or Italy, for instance. You could still, and we can still go outside, not only for shopping or for, um, for uh, urgent issues. So it, it's been a middle of the road approach uh, in Germany. I think that, 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 that helped to, to raise legitimacy for this policy. Um, another thing was that I think most Germans um, uh, appreciated and still appreciate that the government, well, has poured a lot of money into the system, a lot of money, social benefits, uh, new programs just to, to boost the economy or to help the economy. Uh, well, there are some exceptions for, of course, for instance, uh, families with children still are still suffering because kinder the kindergartens are almost closed and they remain closed. So there are some problems with this whole program. But I think by and large, most Germans are still accept this. And you can see it clearly in the approval ratings, for instance, for Angela Merkel. It's, they're, they're still very high, those ratings. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the US, there is a lot of discussion about the role of, of health experts and medical experts and the, the decision makers, the politicians need to take their expertise into account, but they also need to factor in other uh, constraints. How, how would you say was this a balance in Germany? 
Well, interestingly, I think it, especially in the first uh, two, maybe one or two months, the, the main voice, or the, the, the most important voices came from uh, virologists and epidemiologists. And so they, and they also were very prominent advisors to the government. Uh, then after some weeks, economic advisors also came up and just, you know, started to, uh, to, to divert attention to economic problems, economic challenges. But I think up until now, the balance between economic advisors and medical advisors is, is, is kind of stable. And honestly, even among medical experts, also in Germany, we've, we've seen some sort of controversies. You know, there were people, and there still are, that are more in favor of a very strict public health approach over a shorter time, uh, rather than you know having a uh, middle or a more relaxed approach over a longer time. So this mm -hmm. is still there. There are some controversies also in the medical establishment. Mm -hmm. And um, even though Germany is already lifting some of the measures, uh, we we do see quite some protests now. And in the last weekend, there were large gatherings of people protesting the the measures. Um, why do people protest now? And and what groups uh, are protesting there? Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So a couple of weeks ago, we had for certain groups that were heavily affected by, by, by policies right now, parents, for instance, that could not really work because the kindergartens are closed or travel agencies that now are more or less out of business. But now, in the meantime, this, this picture has changed. We now see real political uh, protests with a very, um, well, sometimes weird mix of people. I mean, there are people that, uh, think that some of the measures are well at odds with c civil liberties, for instance. So I think it's it's too just too much. The state it interferes too much in private um, private life, economic life. But in the meantime, there are also some right wing extremists that hijack those protests and they use it just for their own agenda. Also, some left wing uh, um, protesters that try just to to use or to 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 use this for their own cause. And in the meantime. For instance, the, the, the German FBI, for instance, has, uh, um, has warned that there are some, some extremist groups in Germany that just try to use those protests to fuel their own agenda. Mm -hmm. um, kind of connected to the question of civil li liberties, um, I mean, we all long for, for a return to some form of normality, um, and, and quite some experts say we have to wait until there's a vaccine. And one idea to kind of cope with the situation until then is use smartphone tracking apps, to kind of be able to quickly identify chains of infections, uh, which again is, is kind of an infringement on our privacy. Um, how is the discussion uh, about this, like the necessity to fight the pandemic and kind of to give up uh, privacy rights uh, to be able to do so? Mm. Yeah, I know that, for instance, uh, from a U.S. perspective, it's sometimes a little bit bizarre that a lot of Germans care a lot about privacy data protection. And very often, the first reaction is, oh, no, this is, that's just too much. Uh, we, we better not do this. I think in this case, it's a mixed picture. A lot of people are now aware that, especially for public health issues, those apps and digital tools can be very, very valuable. And there's, uh, there's 100,000 people that now just kind of donate their data to the federal public health agency because they have one of those, they develop one of those apps. And I, the, the, I think the main issue is um, whether, people, uh, tr whether people can trust that those apps are regulated fairly and used uh, fairly just to, 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 uh, to boost public health, uh, public health policies. Well, you might have, I don't know, you might have um, uh, um, um, seen that also in the U.S. that there, there was a very huge controversy in the European Union about the new standard for developing those apps. Mm -hmm. There was one group of scientists and some other people that argued in favor of a highly centralized approach uh, to, put, to, to have a central server and put data on the server. Uh, where, and on the other side, you had a, um, a big coalition of scientists from computer science, other sci uh, scientists that argued in favor of a decentralized approach. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Apple and Google were on the side for this, they, 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 they championed the decentralized approach mm -hmm. for very different reasons. And that was one of the reasons why the federal government in Germany uh, flipped sides. First of all, the federal government was in favor of the centralized approach. And then now they uh, stick with this decentralized approach. Um, 
the problem might be that this whole controversy now has a little bit undermined trust or general trust mm -hmm. in those technologies. That's a, um, a collateral damage, you might say, of this, this important uh, debate about mm -hmm. technology. Yeah, and it, it probably would be a good idea to de develop this on European level. Um, and I, I uh, might be an opportunity for the European Union as well, because they have been rather invisible uh, in, in this crisis, you could say. Um, maybe our, our last question, a more difficult speculative questions. Um, what, are, what are your overall reflections uh, about what the world will be like post COVID-19? Well, first of all, I think that's obvious. We're going digital, highly digital. I mean, did, did we, need, we definitely need more digital transformation in healthcare and education and some of that. And it, with, this will help us not only in a situation like this now. So we have to invest in this uh, socially, economically. Well, secondly, well, the economic impact. I mean, the economic impact will be huge. No, no doubt about this. Some countries might be better off. Other countries might be not, not really worse off. But uh, in a, at a global level, this, there's going to be some profound challenges. And if you look at government debt, for instance, well, we're piling up debt right now a massive, ma in a massive way. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with this because what, another lesson will be Yes, there's debt, but we still have to invest. We have to invest in education. We have to invest in digital transformation. Well, and of course, another lesson hopefully will be, I think a lot of us now think about priorities. What is, what is really, what is important in your, in your daily life, economically, socially? I, I hope, as a lot of other people hope, that this has a lasting, lasting impact. But we all know we're human beings. We're, we tend to be oblivious. And maybe, well, two, three months after the corona crisis is really over, yeah, most of us will, be, will, will get back to normal. And uh, I, let's see whether we can really, can really draw the right conclusions for our own lives. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. That concludes our program from Seattle to Düsseldorf. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this, Christoph. Uh, thank you, the audience, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, if you would like to learn more about our online events or programs, please visit our website, uh, jaces.washington.edu. Um, everybody stay healthy and goodbye.